first of all, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, how's your week going? Uh, the week is going well. Um, you know, it's it's actually one of the funny things is typically when you do a book launch, you like you go to New York and then you're doing all this media in New York because there's there's it's a combination of television studios and magazines and radio stations and all this. And of course now in kind of you know continuing pandemic land, you're it's interleaved in from your your home office, which means that I like go to a board meeting, then do a media thing. You know, then yeah. do a meeting with a portfolio company, then do a media thing. So it's kind of a more of a surreal experience, but 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 fun and 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 you know, it's one of the silver linings to this otherwise catastrophic pandemic that you can kind of weave these things together. It's like you sort of can uh, scale your your book launch a little bit by <laughs> yes <laughs> by doing all these different events. So that's 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 uh, useful. I mean, I I started doing meetings again. I moved to Miami from New York and. Mm -hmm. You just you forgot how much energy it took just to get there, and yeah. then go to the next one, and yes. uh, yeah, it's it's I don't know. I, I mean we're in a new world, so it's it's uh, this is and the world is changing. Like now is not the new normal. Uh, don't know when when the new normal will be, but it's it's certainly if there is one, it's months off. Interesting. What what do you mean by that? So like it's not completely remote. It's not completely in person. Well, I, I think there will be a bunch of pressures for people to get back in person in various ways. Um, if you take the investing industry, I think entrepreneurs really want to trust their investors. So the ones they meet in person, even though like if everyone's meeting people in these boxes, they'll do that. So there'll be, you know, kind of a back in person there. I think, you know, once, um, you know, kind of the decisions are being made in the room, people are going to want to be in the room where it happens. And so even though right now they go, well, wait, I discovered I'm so much more productive and I can be in this idyllic location and da da da. So why don't we keep remote, working distributed and remote? The same pressures that had cities and headquarters and all the rest before will return. Now, the question is how they're going to, how exactly and kind of what pattern. And I do think that we've now all been massively, you know, kind of experienced in you know distributed meetings and in, in hybrid meetings and in, in this kind of work and so forth and that tool set will now be across the the professional industry and so you'll have more remote work and more video conference participation and all the rest but um the pressures to be in the room which people don't feel now because they don't see other people in the room when they're not will really be there and that will be a kind of a driving force towards whatever the new normal is interesting no i i, I that feels right. You know, it feels like that's that's where things are going. All right. So in terms of the book, how did the book come together? What were some of your favorite parts of writing it? I know you've got the podcast. Did it sort of evolve into the book or was the book always in in, in play? Uh, well, the book it evolved into the book. Um, and actually, it, it was kind of, uh, I'd say the book was probably um, in part the inspiration of the the creators of Master Scale, the Wait What uh, company. Um, the CEO of whom is June Cohen, who's the you know, co-author and the um, exec uh, producer of Masters of Scale. And it's a little bit about how, about how Masters of Scale came together. Because June knew that I was working on blitzscaling and doing stuff. So she called me and said, what about this podcast, Masters of Scale? And I said, podcast, that's an interesting idea. I mean, I've done audiobooks, haven't really done podcasts uh, before and started listening to them and said, okay, let's do this. And you know, June and her team are so uh, creative. And you know, I had thought, that the podcast was going to be, you know, because I needed to interview people anyway. Go interview people, and then just publish the interview. Like, oh, you know, here's the interview. And of course, they said, no, 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 we're going to handcraft the episodes, and we're going to bring in, you know, snippets from other people who've done it, and we're going to, um, you know, kind of uh, have original music and all the rest. And and, and you're going to be a talent. You're going to perform. I was like, perform. No one's ever told me I'm any good at performing. Yeah. So that's how Master of Scale got going. And then the book. You know, as we started at kind of aggregating in the threads and the lessons through all of these amazing entrepreneurs and their stories and their learnings and their journeys, they got to scale. We said, well, actually, in fact, not just doing the linear thing, but kind of the matrix thing, the box thing of, you know, here's a cluster and here's a set of different stories that it ties to. And that sort of thing is the kind of thing we should do. And so they said, OK, let's let's make a book happen. And I was like, you know how much work a book is? It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, I've noticed you have some co-authors, so it probably it helps a little bit. With with, yes. with some of that stuff, um, okay. So in, in 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 the first chapter, you're like you're talking a lot about no's that the founders hear, and I've heard all of them. You know, I've been <laughs> doing this for a little bit now, and um, you know, what are some of the most popular ones, and and what do you do when you get it? Like, do you start to um, like like how should a founder approach 
uh, the different types of no's they might encounter? Well, essentially there is, uh, no's are great learning opportunities. I'll, I'll kind of, I, I, I kind of presented a taxonomy in the book, but let me kind of share with the group here the kind of the abstract. So there's a bunch of times where you're getting no's, you know, the most prominent one is the lazy no, unhelpful no, which are, which are kind of like the, I'm just telling you no, but you're not going to really learn anything from it. And the general answer is just connect as much as possible. If you're the kind of person who gets crushed by saying no's, be more careful about that. Try to get the support of it. <laughs> anyway, so, so, so what you're looking for in no's is that if you're going out and talking to smart people, and even people who don't necessarily know your space or anything else, you're looking for what the patterns of a no. So let's, let's take, for example, my very early days of LinkedIn, because I was going and talking to a bunch of very smart people about LinkedIn. And what I got from it, literally two thirds of the smart people I talked to about LinkedIn was, well, LinkedIn is a network property and uh, no value to the first person in, no value to the second person, no value to the third person. You know, like you probably have to get, you know, and back the envelope, 500,000 million people before it starts getting valuable. You, you're never going to grow. It, it, you're never going to get to your value proposition. And, and, and what then that allows you to do is formulate what you think and know or a game theory of the game that other people don't, which is I thought, well, a subset of percentage of people will play and will engage and that will grow the network and then it will get to there as a way of doing it that other people didn't, but, but focus on that, right? Because that is giving you a very good network intelligence signal of this is the thing that's most likely to kill you. Um, and similarly, that kind of knows as you're going out is a really good way of guiding it. Now, so, and look, some of my, my first startup social net, so LinkedIn, I'm telling the one I was successful, my first startup social net, what everyone was telling me is you have a leaky bucket problem, which is it's, it's even though you're going to be more than a dating service, you're going to be a professional networking service, a roommate service, a, an activity partner service, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you're going to have this whole platform and you have a platform approach. People are still going to churn at three months. They're either going to found their solution to their need, and then they're going to churn, or they're not going to have found, in which case they're going to be irritated with you and they're going to churn. And so if you have a leaky bucket problem, you have a real problem with what your economics or your business is. And if I had learned, if I had thought about that more and didn't have to learn about it by experience, maybe I would have gotten to the kinds of ideas behind LinkedIn sooner, which is a lifetime relationship with individuals about navigating their network and their, and their work and their career opportunities and so forth versus a, a classified system. Yeah, and it's so interesting. I always because obviously I talk about LinkedIn a lot and I use it a lot. Um, you know, people forget you guys are the oldest active social network, uh, which is, uh, I think, right. There's nothing else that yeah. was before that's still like used in the day to day, uh, which is crazy. I mean, to think about it, like, yeah. you know, it's, yep. uh, it's, 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 it's amazing. So, um, yeah, no, that, that, that's great. Uh, next question I had was around, uh, doing things that don't scale. So it's like the, the the second no on your list, part of the chapter two. Like, can you talk about it? Because I've I've read. I mean, I think uh, Paul Graham, and maybe he got it from someone else, but I think Paul Graham has like a famous article about like doing things that don't scale. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What should a founder be doing that doesn't scale? What should they not be doing that doesn't scale? I think a lot of people don't realize early on what the good things or the bad things to do that don't scale. Yeah. Well, I'm and. and you're going to do some things that you know won't scale, but you still need to do them in order to get to scale. The, the important thing is to be always be thinking about your path to scale as you're going. And that's part of the reason why we opened the podcast with Brian Chesky. Um, and Brian, by the way, to some degree, um, you know, got pushed by this uh, against Paul because, you know, Paul, when, when he was talking to, to, to Brian at YC, Paul said, why are you here? Why aren't you going and talking to your customers? And they thought, oh, that's a good idea. And, but then, you know, part of what Brian came up with is, well, what the thing that's most important uh, to, to making transactions work on Airbnb is some really good pictures. So we'll offer in our best, you know, kind of U.S. market at that time, which is New York, we'll offer to go around and, and send a photographer over to take pictures. And that photographer was, you know, uh, basically Brian and Joe, right? And they would be talking to them about their experience and what they'd be doing. And the reason is when you're doing this handcrafted stuff, and this links very well to Brian and Joe's, uh, Nate, the third co-founder, uh, design sensibilities, which is you start with is like, how would you create something that would just be impossible? Like you land in a city, the mayor of the city uh, greets you, there's a parade in your honor, you're, you're brought in on a Pope mobile down the street, you know, the, you're, you're, you're cooked a meal by the, the best chef in town, <laughs> right, et cetera, et cetera. You know, okay, well, you're never going to provide that. Um, how do you, you know, but what, as you begin to think what down, 
which of those things could you try and which things could possibly be, be doable to scale. And so what you do when you're selecting the handcrafted things are things that could steer you to it, product market fit, scale product market fit, um, elements of magic uh, that could really be there. I mean, so for example, when they were studying, um, you know, kind of like uh, how do people first respond when they walk into a place? And they were doing that in a in a user experience, you know, kind of like just like a, like a, almost like kind of like one by one study. But they realized that everyone who walks into a place, the first thing they do is look out the window. And if you look out the window and the window is dirty, they go, "Oh, the place is dirty." So part of their instructions, the host is clean your window, right? Because even though it's kind of like it's an okay place without a great view and everything else, when the window is clean, you at least looked out the window and you go, "Oh, I got to That's what the view looks like." And and I'm not thinking, "Oh, it's dirty," <laughs> right? Uh, you know, so things like that. And by the way, that then gives you a sense of okay, well, we should be trying to scale this. How do we create host communities? How do we get the host to instruct each other? Um, how do we we give them information about what allows them higher? Um, you know, kind of sales and average selling prices and all the rest of this, all the stuff that gets to scale. But to do that with with handcrafted things that target successful scale. Yeah, because like you're you're. It seems like you're you're doing things, and then if you there's a combination of doing them enough, and then you're like, okay, I can automate it now because I've figured out like I've done it manually, and now I can automate it. And then there's also doing things that like will inspire the the things that you can automate. Um, yes. I, exactly. I like that. And give you learnings that suddenly go, oh, wait, I got to reframe this problem. Right. Like, like, so it's, it's, there's a whole bunch of things that don't really scale that are still very valuable work, but they're targeting at how do I build the, the, the company, the system, the product that scales. Got it. And, and I mean, listen, and there will be some things when you're testing that early, there are going to be some things you do that don't scale and don't like, don't lead to the scale. But like, yeah, sometimes you have to learn by, doing things that didn't end up working out. Like, you know, the, you, you can't always get uh, someone like walking you to the the, the, the path every time. Yes. Um, yep. Okay, uh, next question is, um, so you've got these 10 theories of scale. Um, during your experience at LinkedIn, which of the 10 do you think you, you like put into action the most? Like which one was, you know, the one that like looking back, oh wow, I really leaned on 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 this when when I'm thinking about how we, we scaled up LinkedIn from just getting started and and not yes. having a value prop to everyone using all the time and being the professional network of choice. Were any of them well I think we used all of them. I'm not <laughs> sure that they're you know the interesting question about which one would be well, maybe do you have a favorite? The fa well, favorite. I mean, I'd say in terms of favorite, one of the things that I um, have tended, one of the things you need to do, in, especially consumer and entrepreneurship, although all entrepreneurship is emphasize speed. And so, um, you know, one of my expressions is uh, be embarrassed by your first product release. And we didn't quite put that as a, uh, as a principle here because it's more true for like software and consumer internet software, mobile software, because you can iterate a lot, right? Whereas we tried to make, these chapters be true for all entrepreneurship, including tech entrepreneurship, but everything else. And so the one that probably is most, um, you know, kind of apropos for the LinkedIn thing was being embarrassed by your first product release, which is an emphasis on speed. So when in, in as it was April, 2003, I was sitting around with my co-founders and they were like, oh, we can't launch, our product's not usable. And I was like, well, what do you mean our product's not usable? And they said, well, look, the only things you can do is you can fill out a profile, you can set out an invitation connect, connection, you can do a search basically through your network, and you can be asked for an introduction to somebody. That's it. Like, like we don't have messaging, we don't have anything else, we don't have any anything that really drives it, nothing that really shows you what your use case is. You know, sure, people can sign up and fill out profiles and do a search and then ask for an introduction, but that's not enough. And this is gonna be very, you know, embarrassing. And I said, okay but it works. Those functions work. Right. And they said, yes. So we're launching. Right. And we're going to launch and we're going to see what, because the speed and learning is the thing that matters. We're going to launch and see, and maybe because they were all saying we need to build this feature called contact finder, which is, I can say, Hey, I'm looking for an expert of type type X, you know, someone to help me, um, you know, figure out uh, a market entry into China or someone to help me figure out what, um, you know, kind of data science platform I should use in order to analyze the data I have or da 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 da. As opposed, like we, they were like, we should delay and have that feature. I said, look, if that's the feature that most occurs to us is what we need, then we'll build that feature next, 
<laughs> right? And you know, here we are in twenty, you know, twenty one, and we still haven't built that feature because <laughs> it isn't that the feature isn't possibly useful, but like once we started getting engaged with our with our members and our customers, we're like, oh shit, we need to do this. Oh shit, we need to do this. Oh shit, we need to do this. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that was the uh, the 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 emphasis on being very embarrassed with a minimally viable product that basically was almost just barely usable yeah. when we launched. No, I like that. That's good. Um, you know, so like, you know, people think of you mostly as an operator, but you're also an investor. You've angel invested in a ton of stuff. You've, uh, uh, like you've done a ton of stuff. So, you know, how do you identify and measure if the founder is putting any of these, you know, 10 theories of, of scale into action? Do you, is there anything you look for, or any question you ask them to try to figure out if they're actually uh, thinking in that in that manner? Well, so by the way, one of the things I was an angel investor in was aviary, just for for yep. your own entertainment. Yes, that was <laughs> yes. that was my first job. So yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, so was, so I just figured, you know, some some parallels to that. Yeah, and what they all are is a function of. I mean, the the really key thing in entrepreneurship generally, including in scale, is a learning curve. Um, part of the reason why we do the podcast, part of the reason why we do the book, part of the reason I do my other books is to facilitate a faster learning curve you know, into these things because your, your learning curve for do I have something or not? Do I have product market fit or not? And then by the way, it doesn't end with, oh, I got product market fit, now I just have to execute. It's like actually in fact you're learning all along because as you get to each different level of scale as we kind of detail and blitz scaling, what got you here won't get you there. The way you manage, the way you go to market, possibly your business model, a bunch of things are changing. And so you have to be, it's, 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 it's about learning very fast and learning effectively. And by the way, part of learning fast is not exhaustive. You don't like try every different way of solving a problem. You, you have to have as good as possible shots on goal each time because each failure is expensive. You can fail, you know, and you can recover and you can succeed, but you need to essentially do that. And so, um, and so, you know, what I would say is what, when I'm evaluating investments and founders, it's, um, like a lot of, like a lot of what I very do in the very early days is I, of the discussion as I push on the idea some, because I'm learning for a com that they have a combination of both persistence and flexibility. Persistence, because they thought about the mission, they thought about the vision, they thought about, they've got a relatively good strategy, what's going on. They thought about, you know, kind of what would think about as possible landmines and objections. And then flexibility, because as you throw things at them, they say, look, this is, we don't know, like say early day LinkedIn, we don't know how we're going to grow. So what's your theory of the case, right? Like, why do you think it'll grow virally? Why do you think it might work? Right. And what, what is that? And then what's your plan B and your plan C, you know, kind of like, how are you thinking about it on the unknowns about how to be adjustable, that kind of learning and flexible and strategic mindset at a high speed clock is the kind of thing. In addition to, I'm somewhat expert in this area. I have a good instinct on, in, 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 you know, the kind of the, the network that I need. I'm good at recruiting talent and all the rest of that for entrepreneurial success, both, you know, kind of V1 and then, you know, scale. I like that. that. That's really good. Um, I'm going to do one or two more questions. Um, you know, uh, out of all the, so people here, a bunch of people here are going to get a book. Um, but like out of all the people that you've interviewed for the podcast, um, any favorite episode that like everyone here should watch? Like if they had to watch one episode to get them hooked to watch the rest of them, what would be the episode that, you, what's your favorite that you like just go well, back to? favorite in different ways. I mean, there's favorites from things that surprised and delighted me, um, which could be like, you know, when, when, when the, when, when June said, Hey, we should interview Tyra Banks. I was like a supermodel. Why would we be interviewing a supermodel for that scale? And it turns out that she has the entire entrepreneurial mindset and, and, and that she didn't just succeed, become the, the, the most uh, accomplished supermodel in history. She did it by entrepreneurial thinking. And, and, and application of stuff. And so you're like, wow, that's, that gives you a sense of how broad it is. You go, people like Franklin Leonard, you know, kind of who are systems thinkers and applying that to scripts and movies and all those otherwise, this is kind of arcane Hollywood system. And then of course you have people like, um, where I learned things like, for example, how Ariana Huffington kind of pulls together a quarterly reel of the kind of achievements to have everyone feeling like we're swimming in the same team and that emotion that 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 it kind of that it that it kind of brings to it or the check-in moments 
in it. So there's a whole stack of things. And of course, by the way, there's a reason I opened with Brian Chesky at episode one. Like you cannot go wrong if you've not listened to any master of scale to just go listen to the very first one. Because yeah. you know, Brian and the design thinking, because it's kind of again contrary to that classic Silicon Valley wisdom of, well, there has to be people who are coding before they were 12, and then we've got to be engineers and all that. And it's like, well, here's someone who's a design person. Yeah. But the design is right, and design is important in all of these things. So yeah, I also like right now designers. I don't think realize how how especially with NFTs and crypto, like design is 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 about to become even more valuable than ever before. Um, yeah. Okay, I had a few uh, questions. Uh, it, some of them about the 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 you know just for the last five minutes. Um, the famous PayPal mafia photo. Whose idea was that? I think that was actually Fortune Magazine's idea. Okay. Um, I just think that curious. they no, and 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 funnily enough, when when we took it and and then the picture started circulating, like literally, I got friends of mine cut out my pictures. Was this Photoshop? Is this real? Did you sit down for this picture? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Second one is, um, you know, looking back at like PayPal times. You know, you you did a lot of those deals. Um, you know, and it was PayPal was like, you know, one of the first. You know, at least for this this newer generation. Um, and you did deals that like had never been really done before. Did you have a a mentor early on that like taught you business development and partnerships and stuff like that? Was there anyone that like um, uh, was there anyone either on the team of PayPal or from time before that like you leaned on for this type of stuff? Because like, you know, it was it was one of the first uh, to my, I mean, maybe I'm just a younger generation, but like I look at PayPal as like one of the early ones. That, that would have been it is one of the early ones. It was um, that would have been smart for me to seek out mentors. I mean, it was kind of in the the running fast, like everyone at PayPal had very little experience, you know, kind of doing things. You know, Peter had never managed people before, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there was kind of a lot of. Things I had done my own startup before, social net, and you know I'd had some experience doing BD there with also my co-founder of social net, a guy named Pat Farrell, who had founded uh, the E three conference and uh, Game Pro magazine, so he'd had some experience with that, and so that was helpful. And then I'd some of the people I'd worked with at E World, uh, Craig Elliott and James um, Isaacs, both had a bunch of experience where I kind of you know, was part of their teams. Um, uh, Jonathan Rosenberg, who later ended up being the head of product at Google, uh, managed me at Apple uh, for a bit. So there, were, there, were, there was kind of bits and pieces where I was picking up because you know that that I, I aspired to be a fast learner, um, but I didn't have a specific deal mentor. Yeah, got it. I feel like everyone from PayPal was like a scholar, or was a potentially either going to be a lawyer or a scholar at one point, and then <laughs> or a savant. But yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and. Uh, you know, you, you've, uh, I was looking back at just some of your, your background, like you played uh, chess and games, any favorite game growing up, uh, any, you know, whether it was board game or video game that you, you know, back in the day? So um, the most of the games that I played were either this role-playing game called RuneQuest, which was more towards when I was a kid, and then um, kind of call it mid-kid life was a bunch of Avalon Hill um, board games, Tactics 2, um, you know, other kinds of, of, of games there because it was a complicated strategy games. And those, and by the way, the benefit of those, I think I wrote something recently about games and so forth and why chess is both good and not good. Um, and because part of the thing is when you have games that are mirroring strategy, you want to have serendipity and luck, both good luck and bad luck, and you want to have fog of war, e.g. uncertain epistemology. And chess has neither of those things. And so the, the short answer is, is person X is 10% better at chess. They win 80 to 95% of the games because perfect view of the board, you know, perfect, you know, no randomness whatsoever. Whereas those two are good, which is why in my later life, Settlers of Catan um, has been, you know, one of the kind of favorite board games I play with people because it's the most entrepreneurial. So of our games, it involves trading and, yeah. and, and you know, random some randomness, but resource building and so forth. So oh yeah. Anyway, it's yeah. Settlers play a lot. Of, I play a lot of settlers. Um, yeah. it, it's a good one. All right. Uh, second, two last things. Uh, the first one is, it, you know, 
I, I love to ask this from just investors. Um, but you've done, I mean, you've done in terms of angel investing, everything from, you know, Airbnb to, to Facebook. I mean, I, I, would, I would love to know how that initial meeting with uh, Mark happened, you know, how you even discovered him. But, you know, was there any company over the time that you, for whatever reason, missed uh, or or said no to? Sure. And you just, you because I'm sure you've seen everything because you just, the deal flow and being around all the people you've been around. Was there anything that like, for whatever reason, you decided, uh, you know, I don't know, I, you couldn't get the conviction early on. And then uh, you're like, oh, I missed this or I missed that. Um, was it any famous anti-portfolio? Yeah, and look, the extensive one. So, uh, quick, quick thing. Uh, Zuckerberg um, met him through Sean Parker. Uh, it's detailed in David Kirkpatrick's book, The Facebook Effect. Uh, and then the second thing, look, there's a whole list of them because that's really the mistakes is is what you don't do versus what you did do and was a mistake. Uh, because there's so much more upside on this, and it's probably Pinterest with uh, Ben Silverman and Paul Shiara who came into my office when it was still an angel investment. And I just didn't understand, and I normally understand new media types, I just didn't understand how pin boards were a new media type. Um, and if I had understood that, I would have been, hell yes, because those, those guys are amazing. Uh, but I was like, no, well, I don't get it. And I was like, yep, that's right, I didn't get it. <laughs> I love that. All right, last question, and it's something I ask every time we have anyone who comes on Upstream, is we started Upstream around giving and getting help. It was you know, a place for professionals to give and get help. Uh, what's something that you know, you need help with right now that maybe mm. someone here can help with? You know, obviously we're all going to read the book. We're we're actually mm. uh, next month in the Upstream Book Club. Uh, we're going to have uh, this book, so we're going to have a bunch of people mm. who have the book. We're going to read it. Um, mm. uh, but anything you need help with? Maybe it's a portfolio company. Maybe you want to talk to somebody about something. Uh, maybe someone here can help. So sort of putting it out there. So, well, I'll say that the. the I'll say two things. Um, so one, look, at uh, still at Uralock and Rails, we're looking for best possible technology investments and so forth. And at a seed series A uh, kind of basis is a focus. So that's those are always useful. You know, please do um, come in through a reference or something else if you can, but, but that is very interesting to us. Uh, and then the other one, um, you know, because I, I was reminded of this in Master to Scale, I was surprised by my very first media interview. They said, "Who do you who do you want on Master to Scale that you haven't had yet?" And I was like, "Like, okay, that doesn't that seems a little awkward." And then I realized, actually, in fact, we are trying to to, to figure out how to reach Rihanna because we think her story would be really amazing. <laughs> so if anyone knows Rihanna, right? We don't know how to we don't know how to talk to her yet, and um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, we'll figure it out. All right. Well, someone says they might be able to help. So uh, I actually, I, she's, um, we had someone recently. I actually know someone who can help. Uh, she did a yeah. partnership with, she She had a, uh, an athlete who did the first partnership with Fenty, uh, her brand. Oh, and they have, they, I, I could actually probably help on this one. So her, her uh, and, story would be great for entrepreneurs. I mean, yeah. just, just spectacular. All right. It looks like a few people actually here can help. Everyone knows around, everyone knows around here, apparently. Um, yes. uh, and, and on the first one, I send all, all companies to Mike Dubo. So he's a good friend. Yes. So, uh, I'll continue to send them. Reed, thanks so please, much for please, doing please. this. Really appreciate yeah. it. This was super fun. Um, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you back down in the audience. Your, your time is up.